Great. So good afternoon, everyone um, from Brussels. Um, this is uh, the seventh ESPD webinar on support provision and ethical procedures. And today we have with us four excellent uh, and high level speakers that will guide us through this very important topic. Uh, before starting with the webinar, I would like to give you a few technical information. So first of all, uh, the webinar is uh, recorded and it is uh, web streamed live on Facebook. Um, all participants are muted, um, so you will only be uh, here and have the possibility to, uh, to view the speakers. But you are welcome, of course, to interact with us uh, throughout the entire duration of the webinar uh, using uh, uh, the chat box that you will find on uh, the bar on the bottom of your screen. Um, also important for you to know is that all the presentations uh, will be shared afterwards. And um, with, this, uh, with this, I think uh, we are ready to start. Uh, one last question, actually, uh, one last uh, piece of information also. Um, the webinar uh, also provides captioning, so you will find the closed caption button on the bottom of, your, uh, um, of the screen. And interpretation is also available from English into French. So you will find uh, the symbol of the globe on the bottom right of your screen. And if you click on it, you can select French um, in case you would like to hear interpretation of this webinar in uh, to French. So uh, today we have four, uh, actually five, uh, uh, as I mentioned, excellent and high level speakers that will guide us um, through the topic of this webinar, which is ethical procedures. Uh, this is a very relevant topic. Um, many issues have been raised over the coming uh, in the past weeks um, from service providers on how to best provide support um, in times of crisis, how to prioritize resources, and how to make sure also that um, uh, persons with disabilities are not discriminated when support has to be provided to them. Um, the speakers that we have today with us will guide us through this very important uh, issue. We have uh, with us a representative from the academic sector, Professor Gerard Quinn. Uh, we have a representative from um, the support services sector, uh, Mr. Pep Solé uh, from Spain. We have the representative from the European Disability Forum, Mr. Um, Pat Clark. And uh, we have a representative from uh, the European Commission, um, the head of the Disability and Inclusion Unit, Mrs. Uh, Emmanuel Grange. Um, the conclusions will be then provided by the president of ESPD, Jim Crow. So without uh, uh, losing uh, uh, time, I will now give the floor to uh, Professor Gerard Quinn. Uh, Gerard, you have the floor. Please uh, give us a bit of uh, information and perspectives uh, from, uh, from your point of view. Thank you very much, Sabina. It's a uh, um, real honor to be on this webinar, a very important webinar. I'm going to try and share my screen if I can rely on my tech abilities here. Uh, just bear with me one second. Du, du, du. Three, here we go. Uh, can you see this? Hello? Whoops. Hello, can you tell me whether you can see this? Yes. We got it. It's we working, it. yes. Thanks very much. I'm only going to do three things. Um, I'm basically trying to frame the issues, the practices, the ethical dilemmas from the perspective of the UN Disability Rights Treaty. <clears throat> and in doing so, I basically want to do three things. I want to just remind you what the relevant normative benchmarks are, not getting into it in any technical detail, but just highlighting the more significant benchmarks against which we should be evaluating ethical guidelines as well as practice. Secondly, there's a lot happening out there, but I just want to reduce it down to what's reckonable, what's relevant in terms of these benchmarks and standards. What are the big issues um, and how do we go about resolving them? And lastly, I just want to leave you with some links to resources that may be of use to you afterwards in doing your own reading, doing your own research and so forth. <clears throat> so first of all, oops, I have to get used to the right mouse here. The, the relevant benchmarks, 
let me see. Um, this is my way of trying to crunch down the, the convention into three or four uh, benchmarks that are highly relevant in the context of this crisis. The first one, of course, is the norm of equal treatment, stroke non-discrimination, um, the core of the convention, which of course applies even during an emergency and applies to each of the substantive rights in the convention, including specifically the right to health, Article 25. When you read the right to health in Article 25, it's amazing how it almost anticipates um, difficulties like the ones we're facing right now and insists on equal treatment um, in prevention, in treatment, in aftercare, in professional practice, as well as in the rationing of scarce resources. So there's a very interesting dance going on between the notion of equal treatment and the substance of a right like the right to health. I would also say that individual and collective voice is incredibly important here. Of course, conspicuous by its absence in many of the responses thus far, but we'll come back to that. And then of course, in the frame is the right to independent living. Uh, I'm sure it struck you, it certainly struck me, that at least one third of the deaths in France, and I think it's pretty representative, have occurred in residential settings for older people, most of whom have an underlying health condition or a disability. So it kind of reinforces for us in the disability community the importance of the right to community living. And maybe it gives rise to a new impetus with respect to older people in terms of quote unquote, the future of institutions for older people. These are the most important norms. There are many others, of course, but these I think are the headline norms that, that apply. Why is my thing doing that to me? Um, okay, I think this is important. There is no emergency let out clause in the UN Disability Treaty. That's a little bit unusual. A lot of human rights treaties do have uh, provisions for let outs when there is a national emergency, a war, a conflict or something like that. But since a lot of the more important rights in the convention have economic and social dimensions, in other words, they cost money, um, they are subject to lesser obligations, quote unquote, lesser obligations. They're subject only to progressive achievement. And, and a lot of people forget this economic retrenchment is possible um, and reducing the level of resources, for example, to be applied in a particular sector is theoretically possible under international law because of course you can't legislate against um, uh, a recession or even a crisis or a war and so forth. However, the important thing to remember is there are limiting principles to these retrenchments. First of all, the state in making these cost reductions cannot eat into the core of a right. That of course begs the question, what is the core of the right to health in the context of this emergency? The second limiting principle is states are obliged to proactively consider the impact on the most vulnerable populations. That's not language we would use these days, but it's coming from the formative period of international law on, on these kinds of rights. And lastly, in retrenchment mode, states have to actively consult with the most directly affected. I would say at all three levels here in terms of those limiting principles. And also remember Article 5 on equal treatment is not an economic and social right. It applies throughout emergencies um, and it does not need any of these limiting principles, which is why we keep getting back to um, the right to equal treatment in the context of emergencies. What are the main issues then in terms of the practice and how do you list norms? I would say there's at least four, there's probably a lot more. But in terms of just ease of convenience to um, 
demonstrate what they are. Uh, first of all, there's a lack of, of inclusive preventive strategies. Um, and I think that's straightforward and pretty obvious in terms of who gets uh, support, who doesn't get support, how is that support communicated, how are the threats communicated, and so forth. Secondly, we have situations of heightened risks, which are congregated settings. And I mentioned to you the, the sad statistic from France. Uh, Jared, can I ask you to uh, move the slides? Because we don't see them. Hello? Hello? Now we don't see your PowerPoint anymore. Okay, try to put it up. Do you see it now? Let's see if uh, it will be working. It seems, yeah, now it's working. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and this unequal treatment issue affects particularly the distribution of resources, the rationing of resources. And I'll come back to that momentarily. And then there's a lot of ex, uh, intersectional exposure, prisoners, refugees, older people in particular. I, th I think if you're ever looking for something that really proves the thesis about intersectionality between older people and people with disabilities, unfortunately, this crisis is it. Um, why is that happening? Um, <clears throat> About eight days ago, there was a fascinating settlement in a legal action between the US Department of Health and Human Services, its Office of Civil Rights, and the state of Pennsylvania, which straightforwardly discriminated against certain categories of people with disability with respect to ventilators and access to ventilators. Um, the interesting thing is that the civil rights provisions have not been suspended during the coronavirus emergency in the United States. So therefore the question was, how do these civil rights provisions uh, interrogate that kind of discriminatory practice? What was interesting was the terms of the solution. Um, for example, Pennsylvania was required to remove criteria that automatically deprioritized persons on the basis of particular disabilities. Secondly, Pennsylvania was required to undergo individualized assessments of persons based on objective medical evidence to support medical decision making. And thirdly, and I think this is really interesting, no one should be denied care based on stereotypes, assessments of quality of life. That's been a big issue that affected people with disabilities down, down through the years are judgments about a person's worth based on the absence or the presence of disability. I think we need that kind of crystal clear clarity when it comes to issues about rationing in Europe, and I don't think we're there yet. Lastly, and this is my last slide because I know I have very limited time, um, I just remind you that in the UN system, there's a lot of documentation going back a period of time on how to respond during emergencies, particularly affecting economic and social rights and money, basically. Um, my guess is that at the moment, money is not the major issue because huge of mon amounts of money are being poured into the response to the emergency. The issue is how that money has been distributed, but it will become an even bigger issue in eight, 10 or 12 months time when budgets begin to be reassessed. Uh, I do remind you that the EU Fundamental Rights Agency has produced a very interesting report about three weeks ago on the rights implications of COVID in Europe. This is only its first foray into the field and many more are bound to come. And there's a lot of resources out there, particularly the International Disability Alliance and also the International Institute for Sustainable Development. I've been doing a lot of work on the implications of the COVID crisis for the UN Sustainable Development Goals. That's going to increase in importance over the next eight, 10, 12 months 
as we try and adjust and our budgets respond accordingly. So I hope that is useful to you in setting up what the relevant norms are, where the, the dangerous areas of practice are that need to be interrogated and some of the resources out there that will help guide us through how to deal with this. Thank you very much and back to you, Sabrina. Thanks, Jared. And uh, apologies if you didn't have um, enough time to go in depth on many of these very relevant issues, uh, but I believe you, you provided a very good uh, uh, presentation um, on the legal framework. So from uh, um, the academic level, um, I'll move to the practice and I'll give the floor immediately to our next speaker, Mr. Pep Sole from uh, Girona in uh, Spain. Pep is director of uh, support and uh, he works uh, directly um, with users. So he will be able to tell us a little bit uh, how services are dealing with this and many other uh, very relevant and um, um, tricky issues on the ground. Pep. Good morning to everyone. It's a, an honor for me to, to be part of this panel with these distinguished uh, people that are talking, Professor Quinn, Pat, uh, Jim, and of course you, Sabrina. Uh, you know that you are of my one of my first references in, at the international level when I started working in these issues. Well, I will try to share my, my screen, but I think someone must uh, let me do it before. Can I do it now? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. If you just start sharing your screen, it should work. Exactly. So um, it's a coup it. The, the place is not. You should click on uh, share screen. Yeah, I, I have done, but. Um, okay. Doesn't allow me because there is another screen uh, shared. Yeah, Gerard, can you please stop the sharing of your screen? Maybe. We are still visualizing Gerard's presentation. Exactly. Well, doesn't matter. I can I can go on no. because we don't have many time. Um, to introduce myself, I'm managing uh, one direct service in a local place. Yeah, we are uh, working supporting 1,000 individuals. And these days of coronavirus uh, crisis, we have been back on our new statutes uh, statements that says that we have to, one of our main, our main goals is defend, promote, and develop human rights of people, persons with disabilities. If you want that, you uh, can share the screen now. Yes, perfect, I, I, I will. Uh, Sorry. Yeah. Now. And I remember, I will re everyone that um, the presentations will be shared afterwards as well. Perfect. That means we are a service provider working with real people in the community, in also in residential settings. There you have our figures now but what is true is that we have been reminding that we are also a part of the human rights scheme because in practice someone sometimes must defend real uh, in real situations that rights um what we did that these days adapt international processes ensuring frequent contact with uh, all the users because it's not easy we they are confined we too uh, but we, we must still be in contact with them, uh, adopting internal measures, but also um, lobbying, lobbying because um, there has been some temptation to start cutting some services that um, because they consider the people are not using, for example, daily care centers. For to organize a, a complex support in the community, sometimes you need uh, daily care centers or use some kind of day uh, services. Now they are closed, but the, the, the staff is who really knows the needs and the cap capabilities of overcome the situations of some of the, our users. Uh, we have been defending that because there was a temptation to cut part of the funding. Now every, everybody, including the the services that are closed are receiving 100% of the, of the 
grant budget contracts and also they have reco uh, reconverted the, the task to to make telecommuting and supporting uh, indirect, indirectly to the persons we have to learn to do that um, and also uh, we, we we have to face some human rights challenge what is happening now uh, well, you know that in Spain, Catalonia too, uh, has been one of the focus of the crisis. Our level of uh, infection is high. The, the, the stress of all the national health service is also very high. And um, we know that normally the, the, the access to health of uh, persons with uh, disabilities is not equal. Isn't, there are discrimination but because there are barriers there is not easy to ensure normally uh, reasonable accommodation accessibility uh, language that that um, communication that enables the, the person to defend their rights for themselves this is where we try to to make our intervention also to facilitate them that at the beginning of the crisis for example we found some residential settings that starts to try to send persons to family carers and when it's possible we don't have no problem but for example we uh, we receive one one call from one mother of 85 years who are taking care of her grand the grandmother of, of our users of 105 said what is done my 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 boy here the boy is is 55 years old, one meter 90 centimeters tall, and with uh, intellectual disability and some challenging behaviors that are very difficult to manage normally, and also in that situation for a long period. And that was, um, that happens without the consent of nobody. The first person, the, the, the user who, who didn't uh, wanted to be there because he knows that there will be, uh, uh, in, in a worse situation that uh, in the service that he's normally living. Uh, also, we found that some uh, direct caregivers of the, the at DOMS services, services that uh, provide support at home, uh, were um, refusing to offer support because there were fear of the infection. There, were, there, is, there has been a complete lack of uh, protective equipment. Um, still now we have uh, we have to do a lot of um, managing questions uh, to provide uh, personal equipment to our uh, work, our staff, but also our users and uh, the people that we uh, we are connected to provide direct support. And also another thing that happens is that we don't know what is really uh, happening in some residential settings and also in the uh, inside the hospitals because some visits are not allowed when you are uh, inside them and of course th this is a uh, th that shadow thing that happens um, has focused our effort to try to work on that uh, with that crisis i think we have discovered that bioethics is something real Bioethics deliberations about different values, values in conflicts really exist. And um, I suppose that everywhere uh, happening the, the same protocol recommendations, guidelines, instruction, directives, memorandums from all kinds of go governments. The, in our case, the central one, Catalan one, but also some um, co uh, coordinations, umbrella organizations of service providers providing a lot of directives of what must be done. When that happens, you have to uh, rely on the roots. And the roots, in our case, is defend the, the, the human rights in front of some uh, bioethical discussion that can uh, hurt these human rights. As a result, also, there is a lot of people taking decisions directors of residential settings, directors or coordinators of health units in the community, but also at the hospital, taking direct uh, decisions on real situations of to accept or not, to send to the hospital or not, 
of uh, concrete people. Till now, we don't have uh, news about discriminations in acute to health in our regions. We are uh, investigating with other uh, colleagues from the, the disability movement, some cases, and if we have facts, we will uh, denounce it, of course. But it, has, it happens in residential settings for other, uh, nursery homes for elderly persons with disabilities. And this is not acceptable. Um, this is why we have focus on be close to our uh, our people um, to con to know what is happening and remember that all criteria all um, um, triage must be done in re in the field and individualistic basis not is, uh, as uh, Professor Quinns uh, refers before not in um, taking in consideration your previous situation as a person with disability or you are living in a residential settings. Um, we have been um, supervising real situations. We have been informing the, the people who must take the decisions that uh, which is the, the rights in context of that emergency that must be respected warning about legal actions if they don't act properly, and also um, advising that, that these legal actions could be taken. I remember one, one day where we received a call from a di the director of one uh, nursery home for elderly people, uh, demanding us to sign a recognition that maybe our uh, users there will not be sent to the hospital if they become infected, because they were people with uh, vulnerable situations and there are all the people that could, of course, we don't sign. And also we change this, the, the mind of the director that feels that it's not their role to take this kind of decisions. They, the people living in an institution must have the same right that the people living in the house in front, exactly the same. Can I ask oh, you to yes. conclude <laughs> yes. in one minute? This is my last conclusion. In legal change or has a legal framework has not changed, but someone must uh, be there to ensure that this legal framework is not overpassed by um, uh, recommendations, guidelines, ethical discussions that sometimes forget that uh, the, the legal issues are there. Uh, we have the duty to promote the awareness of that right, N not just in this, in this situation, because that reflects a lack of awareness in the society before. But of course, we have to use that to uh, reformulate the ecosystem of uh, services. Mm -hmm. Professor Quinn has referred before, Article 19 is our goal, but now is our need, is our duty to, to be more strict in fighting that. And that picture is reflects what I mentioned before. This is not the photograph of an animal loving soldier, huh? is uh, but that company was uh, through a minefield, and the donkey that is very useful in many moments cannot be um, keep under control. Must be keep under control. Everybody taking decisions must be controlled to ensure that the decisions will be uh, the correct one in the real situation of every single person. This is uh, what we try to do and we expect we succeed because till now uh, we, we have just nine casualties in 1,005 uh, users. And for example, we have recovered one person with psychosocial disability after uh, one acute, uh, acute to the hospital being there for three weeks. Uh, she, uh, he's a young boy of 88 years. And at the, at the end uh, has been, has been uh, released, at, not at home because at, he doesn't have a comfortable place to live. And now he's uh, in, a, in a part of the hospital, but absolutely safe and healthy. That's all. Thank you. Very much, Pep. It was, uh, as always, very, very interesting to hear on uh, on the difficulties that you're facing on the ground and how you are trying to uh, still uh, 
um, bring your support indeed uh, to people with high and complex needs. Um, I'll give, uh, I would like to remind to the participants that if they would like to ask any questions, they are welcome to type them in the chat box or in the Q&A uh, box uh, on the bars that uh, you can find on the bottom of your screen. And uh, now I would like to move on to the representative from the European Disability Forum, Pat Clark. Um, Pat, you have the floor. Thank you for joining us as well again. Oh, sorry, I'm back now. Um, I believe you're also trying to share your screen. Indeed, I am doing that. Yeah, so we'll wait a few seconds until everything is set. Okay, can you hear me? Yep, very Good. well. Okay. Um, Right. Well, thank you very much for inviting EDF to participate uh, in this webinar. Um, and EDF, just for those who may not know, um, is the umbrella organization defending the rights of more than 100 million citizens with disabilities in Europe. Um, at EDF, we are closely monitoring the, um, uh, the response to COVID-19 and the human rights abuse linked to this pandemic. Persons with disabilities. Pat, especially... Sorry, can I just interrupt you? I'm not sure you uh, are meant to share your PowerPoint or because we, we don't see anything on the screen. You don't see the PowerPoint? No. Okay, I'm if sorry. I was. Is, you should uh, click on the green uh, flag, share screen. This is not working. Um, no worries, we will still share the PowerPoints afterwards. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it doesn't appear to be. It doesn't appear. OK, no problem. Then we move on. Uh, okay. For the participants, we will share the PowerPoint afterwards, so no worries. OK, thank you. Um, OK, um, so uh, as I said, persons with disabilities, especially those living in institutions and those in high support needs living at home, are disproportionately affected uh, by COVID-19. Uh, they are more at risk of becoming infected by the virus. Um, they are more at risk of not being treated. Um, and they are more at risk of other human rights abuses, namely neglect, violence, and lack of support in their daily life. Uh, we are extremely concerned that medical guidelines for the COVID-19 pandemic are still discriminating against persons with disabilities in some countries. Um, triage may be necessary at some points due to consistent underfunding of healthcare systems. A medical, okay, something's coming up now. Um, a medical personnel are overwhelmed by the number and the volume of cases, and they feel they have no other choice but to prioritize. However, um, these protocols and guidelines can never exclude people from receiving medical care on the basis of their disability. For instance, uh, the Bioethics Committee of the San Marino Republic produced guidance specifically on COVID-19, which states, and I quote, the only parameter of choice is the correct application of triage, respecting every human life based on the criteria of clinical appropriateness and proportionality of the treatments. Any other selection criteria such as age, gender, social or ethnic affiliation, disability is ethically unacceptable as it would implement a ranking of lives only apparently more or less worthy of being lived, constituting an unacceptable violation of human rights. We've also heard of other positive examples as is in the case in Slovenia. However, this is not the case in all countries. Last week, our German member reported to us that the German government refused to consider a law on triage, arguing that it was the responsibility uh, of the doctors, the medical doctors, to make that decision. Yet medical doctors may well be biased by stereotypes and direct and indirect discrimination that can cause lives. 
In Ireland, um, it was only after much representation that the Disability Federation of Ireland had finally given a representative seat on the national public health emergency teams, who are the expert in guiding government policy in the response to the crisis. And um, it was almost too late, but better late than never. But this goes to show that disability has not been mainstreamed across government thinking. Jared made a very valid point versus residential care versus community care, and he cited France. But at a point in Ireland, there was almost 60% of the deaths were in residential settings and nursing homes. So therefore, there is a strong argument that we should move towards a community living sometime in the future, or as early as possible in the future. So in addition to the ethical procedures that are compliant uh, with human rights, it is crucial to address um, the supports needed by persons with disabilities to make sure they are aware of their rights. Many people who are sick or whose support network is sick or unavailable are now scared to go to hospital because of the fear of being refused treatment or indeed catching the virus. We heard reports of persons with disabilities that still had to be supported by staff with COVID-19 as their choice uh, was either that or go without support. The lives of people with high support needs have worsened drastically since the start of the pandemic. Some institutions are in quarantine, meaning that visits are not allowed and the situation inside is not monitored. Uh, and this is the example from Austria. While some centres are closed and people had to go back home with no professional support. And this was the case in France where medico social institutes were closed and the same in Greece. In Ireland, restrictions appear to be working in the national sense and the curve is flattening. But the cracks are appear have appeared in the nursing homes and residential care settings and they are the fault line. There is mounting concern that all the authorities in charge of the health service fail to anticipate the, contagi the contagion that has swept through the public and private nursing homes. Also, it would appear that the disability sector is only going onto that curve now with updated statistics and the statistics seem to be lagging behind a, the, where, we are, where we actually are at this point in time. So this means that persons with a, disabilities have often been without, contact, without outside contact while they're in for weeks in nursing homes, and this is now turning into months. So it is important to realize sometimes that not even the means of remote communication, such as phone or computer are available due to the restrictions to use of shared goods, lack of a personal phone or laptop, or lack of needed assistance to prepare those remote communication methods. This also means that many abuses will go unreported. Where institutional care facilities are still open, it is important that government organize visits and carefully monitor uh, their activities to ensure that residents are not left abandoned or put in danger by staff shortages or absence. And we are hearing an awful lot of instances of this on our national uh, news bulletins in Ireland. Residents should have access to information on their rights and reports and the means to report violations. It should also be recognized that regulations designed for normal healthcare may stifle innovative practices that to combat the virus in residential settings and in nursing homes. And this again is something that we have uh, instances of um, in, in Ireland. So, we would like to make some recommendations and that the medical guidelines needed to be compliant with human rights law, including the UN Convention on Persons with Disabilities, can never discriminate on the grounds of disabilities. Governments need to make sure that all persons with disabilities, including those in institutions, are aware of measures to tackle the pandemic, including hygiene guidelines and on their rights and have access to treatment. Government also need to provide additional support to per people with disabilities with high support needs who are more affected during the pandemic and to staff or institutional service providers. A recommendation for the EU is that the EU should provide countries with the lack of personal protection kits with the tools and materials they require to avoid infection. This equipment should be prioritized for frontline employees 
including staff supporting persons with disabilities. Finally, all measures should be developed, implemented and monitored with the active involvement and consultation of representatives, organizations of persons with disabilities. This is essential to make sure that, it, that the services that are offered are impactful and tailored to the needs on the ground. So thank you, good afternoon. Thank you very much, Pat. That was very informative. And uh, uh, I'm sure a lot of uh, things still that need to be understood and the issues uh, that need to be addressed. Um, I will uh, give the floor now to uh, Mrs. Emmanuel Grange, a representative from the um, European Commission Disability and Inclusion Unit. Um, yes, <laughs> Mrs. Grange, yeah. we've been working with you since uh, the outbreak. Um, of the yes. pandemic from day one, and we are glad to have this very open and very good channel of communication. So uh, I'm sure that uh, um, you will have also very important information to share, uh, not only with us as ESPD, but with the entire, um, uh, the entire audience here today. So yes. please. <laughs> thanks a lot, Sabrina, and thanks a lot to ESPD for having organized. You hear me well, huh? It's okay, good. Uh, thanks a lot to ESPD for having organized this uh, web seminar, webinar because it's an essential topic uh, for us as well as for you, of course. Um, we have also received uh, information of situations of persons uh, with disability, situation in which care and especially intensive care has not been made available for persons with disabilities and older persons. Um, and on this point, I want to be very clear uh, for the Commission, it's obvious that no decision on access to care can be taken solely on the grounds of age or disability. Um, we are aware, of course, of the shortages of, on medical equipment and intensive care beds, but this is not a reason to disregard uh, human rights. And, uh, even under extreme circumstances, we have to be extremely careful and respectful with human rights. It seems easy to be said like that, to say it like that from Brussels, but we have to remain uh, strong on our principles. Um, as already said by previous speakers, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is very clear on this point. And the European Union, as well as its member states, are are bound by its obligations, including Article 25. Um, I have to say that there is unfortunately no specific EU legislation dealing with the issue of triage or ethics, uh, of non-discrimination ethics in this area that would allow the Commission to impose directly measures on member states in this area. Um, however, uh, we are on title uh, to remind the member states as much as necessary of the obligations set by the UNCRPD and the principle of non-discrimination. And this is notably what our commissioner, Mrs. Daly, is doing with a lot of energy and commitment. We, the commission, can help member states, in fact, not reaching or getting away as fast as possible from this dreadful situation of triage and uh, <clears throat> lack of uh, social of uh, healthcare or social protection. This is what we have done with uh, various measures proposed by the Commission, and uh, most of them adopted yet already. Uh, I will not make the list of all these measures that we have been through these last weeks, but uh, let me outline the most important ones for today's discussion. Uh, notably, um, the Commission has mobilized the European Social Fund (ESF) and the Fund for the European Aid to the Most Deprived, the FEAD, to help maintaining social services, including for people in need in the member states. This includes the frailest, such as people with disabilities or elderly, who should be able to benefit from quality, affordable, available, and accessible social services and health services. Uh, as regards the ESF support to COVID crisis, uh, the action taken by member states across the European Union aim at supporting the healthcare system. This covers uh, notably purchasing the necessary healthcare equipment, including protective material for healthcare workers, uh, recruiting additional staff for more and extended healthcare services, and 
accessible, I put on the bracket accessible because it should be accessible, communication and information to the public. Uh, moreover, uh, both ESF and, uh, ESF and FEAD can help social workers and NGOs to adapt their work to this situation of emergency. Um, for example, FEAD, FEAD can already be used to purchase material to avoid transmission of the virus and any other measures needed for the proper delivery of assistance in healthy and safe environment for the most vulnerable. Um, we are also working very closely, uh, when I'm saying we, Digiampo, we are working very closely with Digisante, including on re issues related to mental health or the guidelines we are issuing for, to the member states. Um, and our role as the unit in charge of disability in the European Commission is quite multiple. Um, first, we are consulted by all the other, by the other services on a very regular basis on the various documents related to the COVID crisis and submitted to the Commission for approval. Yeah. Uh, we do it's not diminish. The social economy is well placed in the context of EU actions promoting fair, equitable, and sustainable economic. I think someone, yes. <laughs> Sorry, uh, Manuel, you may go on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I know that what I'm saying is not going to give you the perfect answer to the crisis, but at least let me, uh, allow me to say what we are trying to do. Um, and so we are doing our best as a unit in charge of disability to ensure that we have contributions and uh, parts related to persons with disabilities taken on board where possible. Uh, we also support, of course, our hierarchy, our commissioner, Mrs. Daly, the cabinet and the commissioner Schmidt. Um, uh, to, to ensure that the voice of persons with, with, with disabilities is heard within the Commission and outside, including in terms of non-discrimination in access to healthcare. Uh, we monitor the current situation the best way we can, uh, notably from the, through the European semester exercise and the country-specific recommendation addressed to the member states. Not an easy job also uh, to, to be done. Uh, we are also taking into account the COVID crisis impact in our ongoing work uh, on, the Euro on the new European disability strategy. For example, on access to health, uh, deinstitutionalization, social protection. These, these are really giving us a lot of food for thought to see how we can improve the situation for the next uh, strategy. Um, finally, we support the EU NGOs uh, that we finance through the European programs. Um, and because of the impact of the crisis, we are confronted with some practical issues. Uh, so we are now putting in place all possible solutions uh, we have at our disposal to help them coping with the situation and keeping on defending the rights of persons with disability uh, at the EU level. Um, the role of NGOs and civil society organization is indeed for us absolutely crucial. At the EU level, NGOs can provide us with expertise and recommendation to feed and influence our analysis and proposals. That's what many of them have done already, such as uh, EDF and ESPD and Mental Health Europe, who have done, uh, with, with, who have done provided this uh, support uh, without counting their time and their efforts. And we have transmitted uh, their recommendations to the member states. Um, at national levels, NGOs are also crucial uh, for us in sensitizing and advising member states, notably on the use of structural funds in the current context and with the changes done in their use uh, to cope with the crisis. Uh, NGOs are also crucial in ensuring awareness raising within the public. Uh, I would like to know who would have talked about people being refused access to care uh, if individuals and NGOs had not been there to alert the social medias and uh, putting numbers and pictures and words uh, um, on, the, on these situations publicly. Um, ensuring that no one is left behind is part of the daily work of our NGOs at both national and EU level. And uh, they are doing their job, I think, with even more devotion and high efficiency under the current difficult circumstances. So um, be sure that we count on them. Uh, at the EU level and that we are very grateful for the work they are doing. So well, I'm finishing now and I thank you a lot for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, 
It is indeed an excellent cooperation that uh, we have been having over the years and especially now in the last weeks of the pandemic. And we appreciate the reactivity of the European Commission um, with, uh, and the availability on, on so many different files and topics and uh, instruments. Um, I would like to uh, pick up a question first and that we have from the floor. And uh, yes, so we have here a question uh, from one of the participants. The question is about uh, institutions and how institutions have become hotspots for uh, a lot of uh, the COVID-19 infections and deaths. Is this pandemic a final wake up call to close all institutions? And I would like to check if any of the speakers is willing to answer. I believe uh, Pep may want to come in. Yes, uh, well, I, I send it uh, they that very briefly, sorry, because we yeah. don't have a lot of time. <laughs> and I, that the answer, I think the time, the time is not now. We are late. We are late and we, we must be uh, um, aware that everyone can do something from the little uh, residential setting. The director can do something to do that residential setting, something more open to the community and start the process from inside, from, of course, politics who can who must provide policies programs and budget to do it without budgets that allow that and no providers could start um, providing home uh, individualized support support cost money and money must be um, something that um, is not easy to recover reconvert all the sector but um, I'm sure that after COVID, you know, no one can say that is, uh, is something that we don't have to do. We have to do it now. The duty comes from 12 years ago, but the, the situation calls everybody to act now. Clear and I think very well understood. Um, I believe uh, there is also a comment or a question coming from Luke. Luke Zelderlo, the Secretary General of ESPD. Thank you, uh, Sabrina, and uh, my apologies for joining you, you later. Uh, it's not necessarily a question, Sabrina, but I would like to, to share some, uh, some uh, news with you, which is really uh, very, very fresh. Uh, I was a bit late because uh, I uh, was at a meeting that was organized by ESPD for the uh, social services sector. Uh, and uh, also um, EDF and, uh, and Age Europe with not less than two vice presidents of the commission and three commissioners, uh, Commissioner Smith Kiriakides and Commissioner Dali. And um, this meeting, uh, which uh, lasted uh, almost two hours, looked at uh, how the European Union could do uh, better in supporting uh, the social services for uh, people with, with support needs. Uh, the meeting was very fruitful. The fact that we had five commissioners, so three commissioners and two vice presidents there is already, I think, very, very exceptional and, and very important news. Uh, ESPD will provide, provide uh, a full uh, report on that meeting and a press release uh, later on today. Uh, but uh, that, uh, I think, proves that uh, also the, the, the very top of the European Commission uh, is concerned about what is going on in the social services sector and that they are uh, exploring uh, ways on, on how to support the sector uh, better. Uh, I also would like to thank uh, Mr. Yanis Verdecastanis uh, from EDF for his very strong contribution to, to that meeting. Uh, and uh, also the, the commissioners I would like to thank. I also would like to thank actually uh, Emmanuel Grange, head of the disability unit for facilitating the organization of this uh, meeting. Uh, we agreed on looking into the MFF, so the next multi-annual financial framework to see how social services can be supported better. We uh, agreed to uh, look at monitoring mechanism and sharing knowledge and know-how on the crisis. Uh, we uh, also looked into uh, the long-term care work that the Commission is doing and how we can include a, an, uh, uh, a COVID-19 element in that debate and many other things. So uh, a very important signal, I think, from the highest top from, from the European uh, Commission. And that is, I think, um, 
uh, very, very uh, good news for, for our sector and for our cooperation uh, with each other, but also with the European institutions and the member states. Sorry for taking a bit of time, but I wanted to share this information uh, with, uh, with all participants uh, now. Yeah, thank you, Luke. Uh, I'm not sure uh, I saw Gerard Quinn wanted to come in with one last remark about the, the previous question about institutions. Is that correct, Gerard? Yes, just very briefly. Um, I agree with Pep that we're kind of late to the building up the social services and the deinstitutionalization for people with disabilities throughout Europe. Um, but at least we realize we're late. We have that ambition. And I think the main challenge really is institutionalization for older people in Europe. I think one of your Italian contributors pointed out that that's where the most deaths have happened in, in Italy and a completely new policy imagination will be needed in that sector. Um, we have lots of money going into it, lots of capital relief, lots of investment, and I think we need to radically rethink uh, how we deal with older people into the future, and hopefully the way we've been dealing with or at least aspiring to deal with persons with disabilities will have some positive impact maybe in the drafting of the proposed UN Treaty on the Rights of Older People. Thank you for your comments on this, uh, Gerard. Um, it's almost time to close, so I will uh, give the floor to Jim Crow for the conclusions. And Jim, you have the floor. Thank you, Sabrina. Um, I have a couple of conclusions arising from this fascinating webinar and also a couple of announcements. Uh, I shall, of course, try to be brief. Um, in terms of actions, this is to really echo points that a number of our esteemed uh, panelists have made already, uh, but to bring them together. And I think in this context, I'm speaking as a representative of service providers for people with disabilities. Um, first of all, I think it's, I think I should remind us that only in early March, uh, the UN rapporteur uh, around disability issues, Katerina Devandus, uh, expressed concern that people with disabilities are being left behind within the between the response uh, to COVID-19. Uh, she was expressing concern and alarm uh, that the interests of people with disabilities, uh, particularly in medical responses, were being marginalised or ignored. And we've all heard already part, some of the concerns expressed by Pat about triage and how that work can work against the interests of people with disabilities. And uh, we've heard some examples of how that can, can, be, uh, can be counter to the interests of people with disabilities that Pep mentioned. And I would add to that, there was an instance in the United Kingdom only last week where quite a, a, a large uh, support provider for people with disabilities uh, reported that in one week in early April, they had received um, orders from uh, medical practitioners in, in 12 cases, which were saying that people with disabilities uh, were the, in, in these individual cases were not going to be resuscitated or revived or would or receive resp respiratory treatment if they became more unwell with the virus. Uh, the service provider was expressing severe concerns about this because of course the, uh, the, uh, the policy guidance is that everybody should be treated as an individual and their needs, needs should be met uh, as appropriate. But we have to be very alert to these and I've certainly seen other anecdotal stories about triage working against the interests of people with disabilities. So what are the actions that we can take as service providers? I think we must uh, be very strong in opposing any steps that medical professionals might take to not treat people with disabilities as individuals and to look at their needs as individuals and look at their, their health needs com uh, comprehensively and holistically. Um, we must avoid them being stigmatized or being at the back of the queue for treatment. Uh, it is not rational, it's not moral, it's not ethical. 
The second is that we must push for proper data on what is happening to people with disabilities in uh, care homes or in hospitals if they're admitted to hospital. Are they being tested for, with, for, for the virus? Are they being treated? How many people are dying? How many people are being are surviving? We don't have that data in many of our countries. So it's very difficult to establish the true position. We must ensure that proper information is and advice is available to people with disabilities and their families in an accessible way and in a way which treats them as being personally consulted over the future of, of their, themselves as an individual with disability or as their relative. And finally, certainly not last, uh, the points that have already been made about institutional living. Um, we've known for a long time uh, that institutional living is not the right way to support people with disabilities. Um, as Pep said, we have come very late to this uh, in many of our societies, but this is yet another that institutional care is frankly unhealthy for people with disabilities. The risks of exposure to this dreadful virus are increased, and we must uh, promote dialogue with authorities in our countries to end institutional living for people with disabilities. So those are the things that I would say that have arisen from our, set, our webinar today about what we as service providers can do to support people with disabilities. Now onto the announcements. Um, first of all, as uh, our Secretary General has reported, working with EDF and other organisations, we are pleased uh, that there is a dialogue uh, developing with the European Parliament and also with the European Union. And uh, our Secretary General has shared some uh, very fresh information, which is very welcome. And I would add, like to add our thanks uh, to Emmanuel Grange and to the Disability Unit because they've done a lot of work behind the scenes to get us to this uh, level of dialogue with commissioners and with the Commission. Um, I would like to draw attention to our next webinar, which will be held on May the 13th at the same time, 2 p.m. Central European time. That'll be about how we try and restart the social sector uh, to try and come out of this crisis and to support people with disabilities. More immediately, uh, we do have a Facebook group called Joining Forces. Uh, we have 400 members of that Facebook group, and there's a huge amount of information and resource material available on that to everybody who's participating in these webinars or interested in supporting people with disabilities. So please go to it. Uh, it's very useful and you will find it easy to navigate. For those, uh, who are for those uh, people who are members of ESPD and organizations, we do have a help desk available to you. Uh, to give you individualized support as an organization in terms of responding to the virus. Um, and then next week, we do have a, a conference which was to be held in Paris. We have now moved it online. It's the Road to Employment for People with Disabilities uh, on May the 4th and 5th. It is possible to register for that. And we have some very good uh, webinars and online discussions taking place uh, about how we take forward the agenda of securing employment for people with disabilities. And as society in our countries uh, seeks to move out of this horrible crisis um, and get uh, so many people back to work, we mustn't forget uh, that people with disabilities have rights to employment too. And with that must not be lost within uh, the response to this crisis. So I think those are the key points that I, I needed to make in terms of announcements, but I will hand back to Sabrina now for a final word. Thank you to all our dear panelists for their contributions and to you as delegates for participating in this webinar. Yes, thank you, Jim. Uh, not much more to add from my side. Uh, this has been a very informative session. Um, obviously a dialogue that we opened on a very important issue. And we hope uh, that um, we'll be able to collect more information about these issues in the coming weeks. And um, we will surely also be uh, uh, ready to flag any relevant issue with uh, authorities uh, and uh, all stakeholders uh, uh, relevant uh, 
for the topic. So uh, thank you everyone for participating to the webinar and um, I wish you all a very nice afternoon.